Hey guys. So, hope everybody had a good night. And it took me a minute to get myself kind of pulled together today, but I got up around 7.30. And I was figuring some stuff out earlier. Excuse me. And I'm getting breakfast and just I wasn't trying to hurry through stuff. My coffee. So I do have to work today. I have to work 7 to 10.45, which will probably end up being a little after 11. And once again, it's the whole thing of trying to find a ride home. But... Hopefully, we can fix that by December. Hopefully. I'm going to have to... I got to text that... Text Paul and... Ask him if there's any way that we could possibly get one of the trailers by the beginning of December. So... And if he wants... If he wants me to come by and apply... Or pick up an application, I could do that Thursday. Because I do believe I have Thursday off. So. I think. I don't even know if. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to find the schedule. There we go. Yeah, I was right. I have Thursday off. I knew Wednesday was a stupid. Schedule. Yeah, such weird hours. Okay. So I do have Thursday off. So if he needs me to come by and pick up an application, then I could do that Thursday. So, anyway. But I'll keep you guys updated on that and go from there. So I had some eggs for breakfast. I'm trying to make sure I get my protein. And uh, as I said yesterday, I am I'm using the almond milk for my slim fast, and I'm I'm kind of I'm still gonna be using that for a while. Yeah, it's kind of a crutch right now, but I'm at least working on getting myself away from the dairy, except for I'll have yogurt every once in a while, as I know that the pro that processed dairy is not healthy. And I can't wait to get into, like, those pins on uh, the channel off from my Pinterest and stuff that I have saved from, especially on my homestead cooking and homestead cows. I mean, that's more going to be, like, how to take care of them and that kind of thing. But also, like, just the fact that... <sighs> Processed dairy is just not healthy. And by the time it hits the shelf, it's gross. There's just nothing healthy about it. So, I'm trying to get myself away from that, and I, I cannot wait to be able to make that transition to where everything we're eating is healthy. So, anyway. But today's, today's video is on, it's from the pin, get it to come up here, <laughs> really? So it goes back to this, 4,361 pins, okay. I kind of, it took me a minute yesterday to find a different, find another one, but this one is from the Homesteading Hippie, and it's Beekeeping 101, How to Start Raising Bees. So here we go. Are you looking for a new hobby to keep you busy in your backyard this summer? Why not consider beekeeping? And again, we're going to wait a year. 
And I talked to Scott about it, and he agreed it's just going to be better to get all the equipment and learn all we can and be prepared, be prepared for it when we actually do get into it. So, all right. It's a great way to get outside and learn about how bees live and work and enjoy the benefits of your own honey harvest. Honeybees and beekeeping are an becoming another popular hobby next to keeping backyard chickens. Bees are fun, rather easy to care for, and you get honey. There are some things you need to know before you get going as a beekeeper, however. Understanding what you are getting into before you see visions of golden goodness of honey dreams will keep you from getting frustrated. Which is the reason why we're going to wait a year. Okay. In this guide, we'll walk you through everything you need to know to get started in beekeeping. We'll talk about selecting the right hive, purchasing tools and equipment, obtaining bees, and setting up your colony. Alright, and I'm just going to... They give a table of contents on this, and I'm not going to go through it. First one. Why should I raise bees? I know why I want to. Uh, we want the honey. I mean, that's number one because of its medicinal purposes, its health benefits. Whole nine yards, so, yeah. There are a ton of reasons as to why you should keep bees in your backyard homestead. Not only is honey a great natural sweetener, but it serves as an excellent healing agent and can be used for bartering with other homesteaders. Which is the reason why we want to do four hives. And again, we'll be able to collect all of the equipment that we need including all the hive boxes, because from what I was reading yesterday, you need just a regular main hive, a regular hive box, you need it's four boxes. And we want four hives, so that means 16. So we're going to have to collect up, you know, all the equipment that we need, all, you know, the bee suits, everything. So... Honey makes a great gift and should be in every homesteader's cupboard. An antibacterial agent. Honey is often used to prevent bacteria from infecting wounds. It also speeds up healing time if you're injured. Once used to, once used to preserve meat and now a popular treatment for things like the common cold. It's no wonder why honey is so expensive when you try to buy it at the store. Plus, you have to know what you're buying and where it comes from. Thankfully, the honey that I am able to get at Roy's comes from the family that also sells it at our farmer's market. So, I know it's local. You can even use the beeswax from your beehives. Wax can be used in a variety of homestead products like candles, cosmetics, and more. You can even use it to seal your cheese. That's good information because I was actually wondering about that. In addition, if you have bees, you may find that nearby farmers and gardeners ask to rent your bees to help pollinate their crops. This can help you bring in some extra revenue to the homestead. Keeping bees is usually possible in most areas. In fact, while most muni munis municipalities... Bleh, have strict regulations regarding things like chickens and compost bins, you'll find that very few have laws about bees. And again, we'll be on the property, so. In many cases, you can have two or three beehives on less than a quarter acre of land, just a postage stamp, really. And we have 12 acres, so four is going to be nothing. Plus, there are very few people in the United States that are raising bees, and bees are in high demand. Not only do the few beekeepers in the country struggle to keep up with the demand for honey, but farmers are seeing issues as over 40% of our country's bee population has died since 2005, and that is not a good thing. This is mostly due to colony collapse disorder, the direct cause of which is unclear, but probably relate to the use of chemical pesticides and genetically modified seeds. Yeah, I would think. Which is another reason why 
waiting a year for us is going to be a good thing because it'll give me a chance to plant the flowers that are going to be very helpful for those bees. So, and there's going to be our trees and our bushes and all of our garden and all that. So, either way, bees with colony collapse disorder cannot find their way back to their hives and eventually die. This has had a major impact on our honey production and crop pollination success here. So do your part to help raise some bees. It's not that hard once you get started, and I will walk you through every step of the process. What equipment do I need for beekeeping? This is definitely going to be one I'm writing down. Definitely. Obviously not while I'm doing the video. You can beekeep on a budget, but keep in mind that it's not the cheapest homestead hobby you can have. There are some basic equipment that you will need to purchase, and you really can't cut corners that you really can't cut corners on before you get started. Some of the fancier accessories and gadgets can be left for another time, but prepare your harvest and all essentials before getting your bees. Again, stupid ads. Sorry. And a minimum for safety and getting your beekeeping off the ground, you will want to have hives and frames. One of the first decisions you'll need to make as a new beekeeper is which type of hive to purchase. There are many different hives, types of hives available on the market, so it's important to do your research and select the one. Come on, why? Why now? Select the one that best suits your needs. You'll also need to decide how many boxes you want your hive to have. A standard hive typically has two boxes, but if you're just starting out, you might want to you may want to purchase a single box hive. Well, I'm gonna go with the four thing. You want when you visit a link in this article that takes you to a different website where you can purchase something. Okay, sorry. Scratch that. The hive and frames is where your bees will live. Also known as the hive body, the beehive usually consists of two parts. A ware hive or Langstroth hive. Both consist of multiple units placed directly on top of each other. The top is where the colony lives and the lower is where the baby bees and honey are stored. Langstroth hive. The Langstroth hive, created in 1851 by Reverend Lorenzo Lorraine Langstroth, is the most widespread type of beehive. The hive bodies, frames, honey supers, bottom board, and cover are all part of the Langstroth hive. The deep, dive bo deep hive box sits on the base of the stack of boxes and contains 10 frames. The hive boxes typically are wood or plastic rectangles coated with wax or an all-wax foundation supported by wires. This is where the brood will be kept. The queen bee generally remains in these two or three boxes, laying eggs one after another day by day into each of the cells on the frames. The honey supers, which are often 6 by 5, six by five 8 inches, deep sit on top of the deeper boxes. This is where worker bees create honey. During the year these boxes get added and removed as needed to accommodate the honey flow. You add supers in the spring and exchange them for empty ones as the bees fill them up. In addition to frames, each of these supers contains its own set of frames. A top bar hive is another type of beehive. A top bar hive stupid ads Swear. A top bar hive has a long wooden body with long with sloping sides and wooden bars along the top. These bars are where the bees attach their comb, forming a trapezoid shape around the box's base. A top bar hive is another popular option because it is lightweight. It makes beekeeping much easier if you only want one or two hives and need it to weigh less than 40 pounds. What I'll probably do, the four, the four different hives, I will just keep it to where there's only the four, two to four boxes 
in each of those hives. And I'll just continually, like, I'll stock up on the supers to keep being able to keep trading them out. The wear hive is another common type. These are heavier, but allow you to see your bees in action. They are also ideal for people who only want a couple of hives. A Langstroth hive is pretty heavy, and while it doesn't allow you to see your bees in action, it does allow you to maintain multiple hives. You can purchase or build your hive. I will talk about this more below. Keep in mind that if you don't have access to woodworking tools, it will probably be cheaper and easier for you to buy your hives when you're first starting out. We're going to buy ours. You will also need frames. Frames can be removed so that you can check on your hive and colony. You will need to purchase frames that go with your specific type of hive within that category. Hives are usually sold in various sizes. They can, these can be purchased online as well. Seriously. Sorry, my phone was being stupid. The tools of beekeeping. Okay, what I was going to say <clears throat> on the hives, I'm going to compare prices on Amazon. Oh my gosh, I've got so many notifications going across right now. I'm going to compare prices between Amazon and Tractor Supply because Tractor Supply does carry the complete beehive kit. I think. I, I know they carry the complete beehive. I think they carry the complete beehive starter kit. And that's what I want. But I'm going to compare the price of that with like the same thing on, on Amazon. So, anyway. The tools of beekeeping. As a beekeeper, you will need a few tools to help you take care of your colonies. Bee stings are no fun, so it's important to rely on the right tools to reliably and gently handle your bees while protecting yourself from their stings. You'll need a smoker, which is used to calm the bees when you're working with them. Other necessary tools include a hive top, hive tool, sorry, there was something on my phone, a hive tool, a bee brush, and a feeder, beekeeping suit. I'll talk more about this below, but it is imperative that you invest in a good beekeeping suit and i will be while some people just wear thick clothing to save some money a good beekeeping suit isn't exactly cheap you really should invest in a good one to protect yourself and i will they can take the form of a jacket and suit combination unit or a coverall suit you will also need a hood with a mesh veil to protect your face and some thick gloves. The smoker. A smoker blows smoke inside the hives to calm and sedate the bees before you open it. This will make it easier for you to conduct maintenance, repair, honey, honey harvesting, or other basic tasks. Smokers aren't expensive and are usually metal containers that you burn some kind of material, usually paper, in with an accordion-style pump on the side that pushes out smoke through the nozzle. A hive tool. The beehive tool is a manual tool that you will use to pry open your boxes and remove frames. Remember that honey makes things sticky. This looks not unlike a spatula. An uncapping knife. Your uncapping knife is another tool that, help, that will help you when it comes to harvesting wax and honey. An uncapping knife can be electric or manual and is used to pry beeswax cells from the inner portions of the hive. See, we need to learn all this stuff. Bottom board and mesh screen. The bottom board ensures that your honeybees aren't vulnerable to the elements. While honeybees can hold their own during the winter months, if they get too cold, a condition called cold brood can kill your entire colony. You will need to put in a bottom board in the late fall and not remove it until later in the spring. When you take it out, you will replace it with a mesh screen. You don't want to leave it totally open. This can allow 
varroa mites to get into the hive. That's V-A-R-R-O-A. -R -R varroa mites. Entrance reducer. Also known as a frame opening, an entrance reducer helps widen and narrow the entrances to the hive body. You will want to keep the entrance small until the hive is well established, and then enlarge it to give it more to give more room for the bees to come and go as they please. You'll also use the entrance reducer to narrow the opening for bees when it's cold outside. When it's warm, you can widen it to about 4 inches. Honey Super and Honey Extractor A honey super will be attached to the beehive to collect the honey that the bees aren't eating. You can get a shallow or a medium one, either of which can hold between 40 and 55 pounds of honey. That's a lot of honey. You will also need a centrifuge, also known as a honey extractor. This is an optional piece of equipment, but most beekeepers consider it to be a ne necessity. Again, I want to make sure we have time to get everything that we need. That's why we're waiting here. It allows you to remove thicker, denser honey from the super to make removing it a lot less tedious. Pollen patties. Again, not a mandatory piece of equipment, but highly recommended. Pollen patties help your bees get started when they are first introduced. They can also be used to get your bees through the winter. So I'll make sure we have those too. That's the main equipment you need, but make sure you have it all on hand before you pick up your bees, which, again, that's why we're waiting a year so we can have time to get everything. And I'm going to make sure we stock up on everything. So you don't want to pick up your bees and discover that you don't have pollen patties to get them started or enough frames or your entry blocker is missing etc all mistakes we have made so check your list and double check it then check it again the day before you get the bees check before you open your package how to start an apiary a p i a r y apiary you've gathered your equipment and you're ready to get started Follow the steps to set up your apiary or bee community if you're unfamiliar with the word on your homestead. You can't introduce your bees until you have laid the foundation for a successful community. Number one, plant lots of flowers. Success in beekeeping may depend on it. Again, another reason why we're going to be waiting a year so I have time to get all those flowers planted, especially perennials to where they'll come back. The average honeybee can fly up to six miles away for their hive for pollen, and that can get exhausting. If you have lots of flowers and flowering plants, your bees will be able to make quicker work of collecting the pollen and turning it into honey. So I'm going to make sure we have lots of flowering plants. We love to plant bee balm, buckwheat, and lavender for the bees. Leave some dandelions for them. Make sure that we have lots of dandelions. That is often first food for the winter-weary bees. Decide whether you're going to get a package of bees versus collecting a wild swarm. Swarm. Obtaining your bees can also be done the old-fashioned way by catching a swarm. Bee swarms may, may be captured easily, as you, will as you will soon learn. Wow, I cannot talk today. A colony of bees grows too large for its hive and develops a new queen with the old queen and approximately half of the colony going out to look for a new home. These swarms are usually quite peaceful and eager to relocate. That's where you come in. You can easily scoop up these in itinerant bees and provide them a home for which they will be grateful. The swarm usually clumps on a tree limb, making them easy. All you need is a cardboard box and some loot. Some whoppers, maybe. You only need to place your box beneath the swarm and either shake the branch so the bees drop into it or cut it so it falls into the box. If your queen is in the box, the bees... If your queen is in the box, the bees in the swarm will stay with her, huddling around her for protection and to maintain cohesion. Watch the branches around you for small clumps of bees forming to make sure you got her. Close up your box, leaving a small opening for stragglers. 
It's, it is best to give them a little time to find their way into their to their queen, then close it up the rest of the way. Sometimes a wild swarm may not have a queen, and bees need that queen in order to establish a colony. Without her, they may leave your hive. Sorry, my bra is bothering me. This is because the weather needs to be warm enough for the bees to be placed in a hive, and there also needs to be enough available pollen and nectar in your local area for the bees to be able to start gathering food for their young. Package bees. Bee packages are available from bee supply businesses. They generally cost between $70 and $200 and will be delivered to you in the spring. Bee packages tend to go fast, so you should place your order early if you want to be sure of getting them this way. Your package of bees will arrive with a queen, if included, kept separate in a cage of her own within the box. You hang your queen cage in your hive once you are set, and then empty the box of bees into it. The bees will chew through the plug in the queen cage that keeps her in place and set her free. There are certain times of the year that you are better for placing your order, that are better for placing your order. Usually, you will want to order your bees in the winter so that you can get a spring delivery. Packaged bees normally arrive in April or May, depending on where you live in your local climate. You can purchase as many hives as you feel comfortable managing. Most people start with two hives as it makes it easier to learn how to work with your bees and also reduces your losses. I'll get what we need for the four and I'll set up two to start with. That's probably the best way to go because that gives us that starting base. Unfortunately, bees have a high mortality rate, so having two or more hives will provide you with some extra security. A common option for people who want to purchase bees is to purchase a nuke or a nucleus, nucleus colony. A nuke is essentially just a queen bee and a group of her workers that can be placed in a hive once spring starts. These are available in most areas, but if you can't find one where you live, you should buy a queen and 10,000 individual workers or three pounds of bees. Nukes are definitely easier to work with as, as they are easier to introduce into a hive. Three, purchase protective clothing. Even though this category technically belongs in the prepare all of your essential, prepare all of your essentials category, I like to include it as a separate point because protective clothing is of utmost importance when it comes to working with bees. Again, waiting a year. When you ask any beekeeper what protective clothing means, you will likely get a different answer from each and every one. Some beekeepers wear no protective clothing while others suit up fully. Either way, you will want to wear thick clothing with leg and arm sleeves fully enclosed. You can even duct tape. Stupid ads. Use duct tape to do this. The better option is to wear a full beekeeping suit. Which is what I'm going to have. This is a good idea when you are first getting started as it will help ease some of your anxiety about getting stung when you first start working with the hive. You need a netted hat with shoulder length fabric to tuck into your shirt. A smoker will also help to calm the bees. Both can protect you from stings. Once you get stung, it's natural to begin to swat at them, dance around or get all excited. That can lead to more stings as the hive goes into more into protective mode. So get some gear and protect yourself. Assemble or build your hive before your bees arrive. A common mistake that many new beekeepers make when they first purchase their bees is that they think their packaged bees will come with the hives. That's not the case. You will need to purchase a fully assembled hive or build your own. If you don't have your own wood shop, you will probably want to purchase an assembled hive, and that is exactly what we're going to do, is purchase the hive. Because I don't want to take chances. I really don't. Especially since I don't really, I don't have any knowledge about it. Like, I'm learning this, and yes, we're going to take a year, but I would rather buy the hives and know we have what we need. Even if you build your own hive, it's recommended that you purchase top bars. I swear, stupid ads. 
These can be quite difficult to make and you want them to meet certain dimensions. This will encourage your bees to build straighter combs. If you're able to, you might also want to consider building a glass viewing window. This will allow you to check on your bees and observe their progress without having to disturb the colony. Before your bees arrive, you should use melted down natural beeswax to coat the top bars in the hives. This will encourage the bees to build comb there. You can purchase beeswax online if you don't have it, if you don't already have any. Melted down, okay. All right. And I do have beeswax, but I'll probably I'll probably just go ahead and buy some more specifically for that reason for coating the top bars. Know where you will put your hives. Our hives are right in the chicken area as chickens and bees get along well. It's got some shade from the trees there and is out of direct winter wind. It's also very close to our garden, giving them access to all the flowering plants. You want them far enough away from your family and neighbors for all to be safe, yet easily accessible to check on the bees regularly. It's generally recommended that you have an, at least an eight of an acre of land. Make sure that the space you select has an easy way for your bees to get through so you don't affect their foraging potential or ability. Well, we have enough land, so... You may also want to check your local laws before you begin. Some cities or localities have restrictions on the number of hives you are allowed to have, as well as the spacing required between your property line and your beehives. Okay, well, again, they're going to be inside the privacy fence on our property, so it shouldn't be an issue. And we're not in the city. Reaching this researching this information ahead of time will reduce the likelihood that you will have to pay cumbersome fines or worse, get rid of your bees later on. There's research. Big one. Always do your research. And again, that's why we're taking that year. There are other legal considerations you may need to make. Often, people who live in rural areas can do whatever they want in regards to beekeeping. However, if you live in an urban area or even a small town, you need to remember that the following conditions are often regulated by the government. There, yeah, there that goes. Number one, hive location. Hives often cannot be closer than 15 feet to a walkway or property boundary. Number two, number of hives. Number three, permits. They often have associated fees to make sure you factor and make sure, so make sure you factor, factor those in. Blah, blah, blah. Getting all tongue twisted. And four, inspections. In addition to a permit, you may also be required to submit to regular inspections. The bees should be out of the direct path of any foot traffic. Usually, the less foot traffic you have at the entrance of the hive will be better for the bees as well as for you. Consider other factors too, like the winter weather in your area and the direction of the wind. I'll have to figure that out on the property. The best location for your beehives will be a direction that faces somewhere between south and east. Okay. That one I'm going to have to figure out once we're on the property because... I think the clearing... I don't even know. I'll have to figure that out. If the hives can get some afternoon shade in the summer, but plenty of sun in the winter, that's all the better. How do you accomplish this? Simple. Put your hives under a deciduous tree where they will have shade in the summer, but the leaves will be bare to provide warmth in the winter. You may also want to raise your hive up off the ground a few feet. This will make it easier for you to work with and will also get it out of reach of certain pests like skunks, although they can still sometimes infiltrate. You can elevate your beehives by putting them up on cinder blocks. Make sure the hives are level from front to back, top to bottom, and side to side. You may have to add shims for stability. You also need to make sure you have enough space to walk between your hives if you have more than one and that you can easily work around each hive. In addition, if the hives are too close together, you may find that the bees become acclimated to each other and let their guard down. This can lead to them robbing each other's hives. 
Try to keep your hives several hundred feet away from each other. Okay, I have to remember that. Understand basic beekeeping terminology. Know what a frame is, what a queen is, what the worker bees do, and be able to check for queen cells. Understand what mites are, how to prevent mold in the hives, and how to keep the bees alive during the winter. Here are some great books to read first. Okay, I'll look into that in a second. Also check with your local 4-H extension office and join a beekeeping club. There will be lots of advice and answers about keeping bees in your area. Some of the most... Hang on, guys. Sorry about that, guys. Anyway. Some of the most basic terminology you should know. The difference between the types of bees in the colony. The queen is perhaps the most famous and definitely the most important. Every hive will have only will only have one queen bee and she is the individual in the hive with the ability to reproduce. She will mate with dozens of drones before coming back to the hive, storing the sperm to use for the remainder of her days, which is usually about five years. And the queen is responsible for laying the entire batch of eggs for the whole colony making the decision on her own when they are going to lay workers or drones. The male bees of the colony, drone bees, have a sole purpose of spreading the genetics by mating with other colonies' virgin queens. They die immediately after mating. Bees who are not able to mate then come back to the hives to eat, and because they don't have any other role besides to mate, if they remain in the hive after swarm season is over, they are kicked out by the worker bees. Worker bees are sterile females. These bees are responsible for the foraging, providing food to the young, and defending the hive against predators and producing wax and honey. They, re truly, they really are true workers. A worker bee will conduct a variety of jobs in her lifetime, which is usually about five weeks long. As a worker bee ages, her duties become more dangerous and require her to move further away from the hive. Number seven, know if anyone is allergic to bee stings. None of us are, thank God. That won't necessarily mean that you can't keep bees. But if someone in your family is allergic to bee stings, you will want to keep them in the house when you are working with the bees. Same goes with close neighbors. If they are allergic, let them know ahead of time you are going to be working with the bees. For example, we don't mess with the hives when my neighbor's granddaughter is over for a visit with her. It's just a safety measure we take to lessen the chance of her getting stung. Of course, they are still going to be bees whether or not we keep them and she has a chance of getting stung anytime she steps outside, but we err on the side of caution. Number eight, decide what bee, kind of bees you are going to get. There are several types of honeybee breeds, a fact most people don't realize since they are so small. However, you will want to keep in mind your beekeeping goals, environment, and needs when you are determining the best type of honeybee for your homestead. Here are some of the more popular bee breeds. Carniolans. C-A-R-N-I-O-L-A-N-S. Carniolans. These small bees are darker brown in color and are very calm. They don't usually swarm, a good thing if you are trying to maintain productive hives, and are both disease and winter hardy. The compromise is that they don't produce quite as much honey as the other type of bees, Italians. These light yellow bees are the most common types of honey bees kept by novice beekeepers. They don't tend to be aggressive, but they don't do as well in the cold. Caucasian bees. Caucasian be Caucasians are light silver and cold weather resistant. They will reduce your supplemental feed needs because they forage year-round in most cases. Like car Carniolans, they don't produce as much honey, but it is still tasty. These bees produce more propolis, propolis meaning you will need to clean the hive more often, and they are not resistant to de disease and mites. Buckfast a cross between Italian and European honeybees. 
These bees are great pollinators and are also disease and mite resistant. Unfortunately, they cannot be kept in cold climates and need a lot of supplemental food when the temperatures dip. Russians. These bees are some of the most aggressive bees you will find. They swarm often and don't like to fly far in search of food. However, they are very disease and weather resistant. Number nine. It's going to be kind of a thing trying to figure out what ones we want. I just have to find out what ones are the best for this area. Number nine, decide where you are going to purchase your bees. It's always best to purchase your bees locally so that they are already hardened off to your local environment. And that's exactly what I was saying. And that's exactly what Doug and Stacy have said on their videos. If you are buying packaged bees from a local source, make sure you confirm that the bees were raised locally. It is not uncommon for sellers to ship in bees that were used to pollinate crops in other locations, in some cases as far as the other end of the country. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Queen bees are often sold individually, but you can purchase workers and drones in small quantities or even a hundred at a time. A nuke is one of the most expensive expensive ways to buy bees, but it's also one of the easiest as your colony will already be established. You need to plan ahead when buying your bees, particularly if you're ordering them online. Make sure the bees you order come with a warranty, particularly if they are being shipped as they will be exposed to severe stress and more likely to die. Order them that way. I'm hoping to be able to just either get them locally or get our own swarm. Know the life cycle of a bee. I already told you about the differences between drone, worker, and queen bees, but it's also important to understand the life cycle of a bee so that you are able to nurture your bees to maturity. Once an egg is laid, it will be incubated for about three days. For the next week, the eggs will exist as larvae and will feed on the honeycomb in the hive. The worker bees will continue delivering pollen to these developing bees, doing this for 16 days after incubation. After that, the young bees will begin to leave the hive and investigate their own food sources and will progress to become worker bees or drones. Installing your bees. Now that you have your hive set up and ready to go, it's time to introduce your colonies. You should do this by following these steps. <laughs> Number one, introduce package bees. Once you have your bees, it's time to install them. Before you put them inside, make sure all of your top bars are on the hive. You will need to remove several top bars and put false ones back in, the exact number of which will vary depending on the size of your colony. Usually, you will want to insert your false, ten, your false back 10 bars from the front of the hive. This will help to establish your brood nest at the front of the hive. You should then remove at least five more bars between the false back and the entrance between when you will install the bees. If you have a package of bees, your queen will be in a separate cage. You should put this on top of the hive until the bees are installed. Shake the box with the bees as you empty them into the hive. This will ensure that they make it out of the box. It's a good idea to introduce your new bees during the afternoon. This is the warmest time of the day and will give you the most light. This can reduce stress. You might also want to offer supplemental food where you, while you are installing your bees. Add more every 30 minutes to make sure your bees know that this is where they will be fed and safe. After introducing your bees, try to keep the area around the hives calm. Keep people and animals away for at least a few days as this kind of stress can cause the hive to swarm. Okay, and you, there's tons of videos out there. Even Doug and Stacy have videos on installing bees. Sorry, excuse me. Sinus issues. Not bad ones, just little ones. Right. Stupid ads. Oh, come on, really? Okay, sorry. 
Intro number two, introducing the queen. Once the rest of the bees are in the hive, you can put the queen bee into the hive. You have a couple of options as to how to do this, but I'm going to tell you the best way. It takes a little longer, but it's definitely worth it. To introduce your queen, you should suspend your cage between the third and fourth bars closest to the entrance. At this point, you should have a ton of bees flying around, but most of them should end up on the hive. Pull all but one of the bars, put all but one of the bars back on the hive. Make sure your bees figure out where your hive is. You can do this by watching closely or for fanning behavior. While the bees begin to fan out, it is essentially their way of letting you know that the queen has made it inside and that they have located her. This can take up to an hour. Excuse me. You should not remove the queen from her cage for the first few days. You need to give time for the other bees to find their queen. Once most of your bees have made it inside, you can release the queen over the hive. Make sure you do not drop her on the ground. Work only directly over the hive where the top bars are removed. I like the idea of the other bees like releasing her. You can move the faults back to the back of the hive about a week after you introduce your bees. Then you can put in your spacers and move the bees and combs about three bars from the entrance of the hive. This is known as the indirect method of introducing your queen. It requires a lot of monitoring and a lot of patience. You need to make sure your drones accept your queen. Now the other alternative, and this is the option you should not pursue even if you are in a hurry, is to simply dump your queen bee into the hive. This can sometimes work if your drone bees accept and welcome your queen, or it can backfire because they might attack and kill her immediately. If you purchase your queen as a separate unit from the rest of your bees, this is a costly mistake. Queen bees can cost $100 or more, so I advise using the indirect, time-consuming method of introducing your queen instead. Work with your bees. You will need to work with your bees from time to time and not just when you are harvesting honey. It's a good idea to maintain a calendar of when you need to work your bees so that you don't fall behind in any of the necessary tasks. Periodic maintenance will consist of checking on your hive to make sure your queen is laying eggs, that your workers are building up stores of honey, and that your colony has enough space. You don't need to check on your hives that often during the winter because in the cold months the colony will cluster together and eat their honey stores. They won't come back out until the temperatures are above freezing. Feed your bees. Sometimes you may need to provide your bees with food. This should be done with an equal mixture of sugar and water. You can give your bees food by punching holes in the top of the hive and hanging food jars filled with sugar water inside. This will provide your bees with nutrition and calories until they have had time to forage. You may need to do this during the early spring months too. However, feeding your bees is generally not a good idea unless it's winter and they can't find anything to eat. Then you can safely do it to avoid starvation. Placing your hives in the garden is always a good idea too. This will give your bees direct access to food. They particularly like nutrient-dense pollens from plants like pumpkin, calendula, lemon balm, thyme, mint, echinacea, and sunflowers. I'm glad they have that list right there. And I'm going to be writing this out. Like I'm really glad they have that list. You can also feed your bees supplemental foods like their own honey or even fondant icing or marshmallows. They love these sweet treats. Stupid ads. You should also be supplying your bees with clean water if you are in a time of intense heat or drought. Put a container of water out that is about an inch deep. Put it on the calendar. You should also be monitoring your hive regularly. Mark the calendar so you know when you need to check. You can check your hive every day if you want, but remember that repeated opening of the hive may result in bees who become cranky or more likely to sting. Check your bees at least once between when they are introduced in the spring and when honey is harvested in the fall to make sure they are flourished and building a vibrant hive. Uh, okay, and then you can... You can look up a lot of videos on harvesting honey, including like from Doug and Stacy. So, watch for pests and predators. 
You will also need to keep an eye out for pests. If you see bees with deformed wings, a lack of larvae, a weakened colony, or hive beetles or wax moths, you will need to apply treatments. Some of the most common honeybee pests include tracheal mites, varroa mites, wax moths, and small hive beetles. Varroa mites are the most common honeybee pest, and these creatures feed off the blood of adult bees and the bee larvae. They can weaken your colony to the point of collapse. You can use pesticides ahead of time or even fumigants once you notice an infestation, but these are often ineffective. And you don't want to use chemicals. You just don't. Come on. These ads are annoying the crap out of me. Anyway. From time to time, you may want to double check on your bees and make sure they aren't being harassed by any predators, which I will. There are a lot of animals who like honey as much as we do, including bears, skunks, and opossums. You can put up electric barriers or chicken wire to help keep the animals away. This will ensure the vitality of your colony. The chicken wire is probably a good idea. The bears I'm not so worried about because we're going to have that privacy fence. So, And a gate going that's in front of the trail that we're going to make through the woods. So I'm not as worried about that. Prevent disease. There are even some diseases that can impact your colony. Foul brood is one of the most lethal. It is also highly contagious. This disease spreads quickly between hives and is caused by bacterial spores. It causes larvae to die and prevents worker bees from de delivering nectar. Chalk brood is another common disease. This comes about during the early spring and there is no defined cure. You can sometimes sterilize wooden pieces of the hive and throw away infected honeycomb to prevent the spread. A sweet, a sweet reward for your hard work, harvesting honey. The process of harvesting honey from your beehive is actually quite simple. The first step is to wait until the bees have had time to build up their supplies and produce enough honey for you to harvest. This usually takes around six weeks, but can vary depending on the climate and conditions where you live. Once the bees have produced enough honey, it's time to take action. The first thing you'll need to do is put on your beekeeper suit and gloves to protect yourself from getting stung. Next, smoke out the hive using a smoker or another method that the bees will be less likely to sting you. Once the hive is smoked, you can, produce, you can proceed with greater safety and less disturbance of the colony. When you're ready to harvest, you will need to remove the hive frames once the autumn months arrive. Remove the wax and honeycomb, scraping it into a bucket with a heated knife. Allow the honey to slowly sink down to the lower levels of the bucket, and then you can pull out the wax cappings. You'll be left with honey to eat, and you can turn the wax into candles, and you may need to use an extractor to keep the wax separate from the honey. The simplest way to use an electric honey extractor. The simplest is to use an electric honey extractor. This will spin the comb and extract the honey without damaging the comb so you can put it back in the hive for the bees to use again. Okay. Once you've extracted all the honey from the frames, it's time to bottle it up and enjoy. Honey harvested from your own beehive is a delicious and healthy treat that you can enjoy knowing that you made it yourself. Plus, it makes a great gift for friends and family who are sure to appreciate your hard work. Harvesting honey from your beehive is a rewarding experience that anyone can do with a little patience and the right equipment. That being said, you can get some good money for your bees' products. In addition to what you are keeping for yourself, organic honey sells for up to $12 a pint, while a single one-pound wax brick can go for $10. Know that you probably won't get honey that first year. Sadly, most of us who are first-timers at raising bees and have dreams of flowing honey, but that's not often the case. Most of the time, the bees will need all that, that, all that they collect to get them through the winter. But the second year can yield quite a bit of golden deliciousness, unless you're in a very northern climate and you're not. So, 
we should get honey in the second year. Your success in beekeeping will vary. There are some people who are wildly successful with minimal experience and others who, are, who constantly struggle. This is largely because beekeeping is a very local experience and is heavily influenced by the environment. If you raise bees in the north, it's probably going to be more challenging than raising them in the south. Just keep in mind that you will need to devote some time to caring for your hives one way or the other if you want them to consistently produce. Often that means one to three hours per week when your hive is producing honey that needs to be processed and stored. Make sure you have the time to devote to bees before you get into them. Won't bees sting me if I steal their honey? <laughs> bees are actually quite docile creatures. Mostly they will only sting humans if they feel threatened. This means that as long as you're careful and you take the necessary precautions, you shouldn't have any problems with getting stung. A smoker mentioned above helps to keep bees calm and from reacting violently to perceived threats to their hive or queen. Of course, even the best beekeepers sometimes get stung by their bees. If this happens, don't worry, but most importantly, don't freak out. If you start swatting and overreacting, yeah. Oh my gosh, now I have to find where I left off, because my phone was being stupid. Sorry, guys. I'm almost done with this, too, and then my phone freaked out. I hate my phone. I should be able to get a new one here soon. I go all the way to the bottom. I was so close to being done. This makes me so mad. Sorry, guys. I just read that. Okay. If you start swatting and overreacting, the hive is likely to become agitated. There are a few things you can do to relieve the pain and swelling. First, remove the stinger from your skin as soon as possible so that more venom isn't injected into your body. Next, apply a cold compress to the area to help reduce the swelling. Finally, try to keep the affected area elevated so it doesn't continue to swell. If you follow these steps, the pain and swelling from a bee sting should go away r relatively quickly. Ugh. And with a little time and practice, you'll be able to avoid getting stung altogether. Remember, a suit will prevent stings pretty much all of the time. I'm definitely going to have the suit. And I'm not going to mess with them without it. And I'm going to see if I can find a mentor. Mentor. Consider finding a mentor. For the majority of us, those first steps are always the most difficult, filled with perplexity and doubt. How am I supposed to deal with these little critters? What does that behavior signify? What are my, why are my bees acting so irritable and unproductive? Madness. I'll never get honey at this rate. Don't give in to that kind of self-doubt. Finding yourself a mentor is one of the most significant things you can do when you're just getting started as a beekeeper and is a great way to boost your confidence. And I think I'm going to try to get a hold of the people who package and uh, sell the honey at the farmer's market down here. Probably be the best thing to do. So, okay. A mentor is a seasoned beekeeper that can answer your questions and even demonstrate what right looks like when it comes to chores and typical bee behavior. A veteran beekeeper can give you advice on everything from which type of beehive to use to how to deal with pre-swarm pressure, pests, predators, and diseases. When you're just getting started, having an in-person mentor is a blessing. Therefore, you should look for someone in your area who will accept you as a trainee or apprentice. If you know anyone who keeps bees, ask if they'd be willing to assist you to get started. Oh, come on, really? Sorry, I hate the ads. Drive me nuts. There are frequently beekeeping clubs or groups in most areas that would be pleased to help a new beekeeper if you cannot locate a mentor on your own. Don't be scared to reach out and ask for guidance. Again, I think I'm going to try to get a hold of the people that uh, sell the honey at the farmer's market. It's one specific couple that I do believe live in town or just out of town. Be well, citizens. Picking up beekeeping as a hobby is a great way to spend your summer days if you're thinking about becoming a beekeeper. We highly recommend it. Not only is it a fun and rewarding hobby, but you'll also be helping out our little pollinators in the process. 
Understanding the bees you want to keep and knowing what you are getting into will be the key to your success. Success. Uh, understanding the bees you want to keep and knowing what you are getting into will be the key to your success in beekeeping. Here's to your successful buzzing. If you found this article helpful, please share it with others. Okay. So yes, if you find this video helpful, you can also find this on Pinterest. If you don't do Pinterest, it's okay. You can find a bunch of videos on it. Doug and Stacy have their videos on their channel. Obviously, there's going to be more on on this on our channel. Just because I'm reading this information and putting it out there. So, anyway, that was quite a long one. But I. That was a necessary one. That's going to take a long time for me to write out as well, but it's going to be necessary because I'm definitely going to need all that information. But again, we're we're definitely going to be waiting a year so we can learn all we can and see if we can see if I can get a hold of the couple that packages and sells the honey at the farmers market here. So anyway, do your research. Find that mentor, learn all you can, and then, you know, when you're ready, like within six months to a year, go ahead and do it. So, I'm going to get off from here and get this uploaded because it's going to take a minute because it is long. And I didn't mean for it to be that long, but it was a long article. So, I will see you guys in the next video, and keep your heads up. Like and share the videos, and please, please, please share the videos. Like and subscribe to the channel, and just recommend it, share it, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye, guys.